It is said in progressive and revolutionary movements that you judge the character of a movement by its martyrs. Let us die fighting in the barrio, in the jails, in the college campuses, in the fields, in the streets, for our raza. Let us all be organizers in every day of our lives. Chicano! Chicano! This is a commemoration for the fallen heroes that gave and gave and gave till it cost them their lives. They are not dead. They are here in every one of you. Everyone here is Ricardo. Everyone here is one of the seas. The intense repression faced by mass movements for social justice, such as the Chicano movement of the 1960s and 70s, led to the imprisonment and death of activists. Some of these courageous sacrifices are well known. Less well known are the martyrs of the Chicano movement, 40 years after nine young Chicano activists were martyred in Colorado. Over 600 people gathered for a historic event in Denver to commemorate their legacy. What would Los Ace the Boulder and these other young people that died, what would their lives have been like? What contributions could they have made had they lived? The contradictions in the society during the time of the Vietnam War reached a peak, and that is right when these killings happened. The state underestimates the power of history, and history rarely stays put in a forgotten, disconnected past. And that is the door that we have opened today. Que viva la raza! Thinking about the experiences that led up to the Chicano movement, the 1960s, the evolution of, of popular struggle, political struggle, I think the, the communities were in search of identity. They were in search of, of a place that they could historically claim. The Chicano movement gave us an option. It gave us a different perspective and a different way to dedicate ourselves. We had experienced colonialism. We had experienced the idea that we had been expulsed from the land, that we had, many of us had lost the language. We didn't understand this, the, that this was part of, the, of a system of oppression. They don't teach you an alternative history, they just teach you the straightforward American version of American history, right? We knew there had been a war against Mexico, but we didn't understand that that war involved us. What was really passionate for all of us was the knowledge that we were colonized people. This deeply penetrating prejudice fed us the notion that we were less than, and we were certainly set apart. And that came through in the neighborhoods and in the schools in various ways. Everybody was fed up. We had reached a point where there was, uh, there was no turning back, really, because we had never accomplished anything. We were at the bottom of every aspect of society, economically, educationally, every aspect. We were at the very bottom. And so we decided, OK, we're going to have to fight back, and we're going to have to start showing that we can become a power within the society. Calling oneself Chicano or Chicana recognized a connection to indigenous history and became a way to express a newfound pride in a shared cultural, ethnic, and community identity. You know, my roots are in northern New Mexico, and in northern New Mexico, there has always been in my lifetime talk about land and talk about what happened. Coming from the San Luis Valley, and my parents always believing that in the land and being farm workers. And my grandfather used to always start every story with, cuando la tierra era de, de nosotros, when this land was our land. Every story he ever told us. And growing up, I never understood that. But 
in the 1960s when I became part of the Chicano movement, I reflected on that and I said, oh my God, now I know what he meant. The land was stolen. We are, as Chicanos, we recognize that we have been on this land for hundreds of years. The Spanish came and conquered the natives. We are the natives, so now, being uh, mestizos, our mestiza, we have the indigenous blood, we have the European blood. We have connection to the continent. We have been here. This is our homeland. And we began to search for our ancestors and who were they? And that led us back to the indigenous periods, the indigenous times of Mexico. People had been living in what today is called Central America, Mexico, and the Southwest for thousands of years before European conquest. Indigenous peoples created highly organized civilizations such as the Olmec, Maya, Toltec, Aztec, and Teotihuacan that had robust systems of trade, artistic production, architecture, agriculture, as well as writing systems and calendars. So to have someone now come forward and say, you're indigenous, you are uh, descendants of great people, the Mexica tribes, that was incredible. And it gave us pride for the first time. That was what was so burning. And that's what gave the movement, if you will, the personality or the identity that it had. And we were indignant. We were pissed off that we were lied to, cheated out of our lands, that our families had gone through so much prejudice. We were angry, damn it, and we were gonna go to the university and get our educations and go back and make a change. That's what we were there for. And, and that's what held us all together. And then in that process, we studied and organized and studied and organized. You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veli now. Our hard reality is that standing against injustice in the schools, in the fields, the courts, and the streets do not come without sacrifice. And for those who made the greatest sacrifices, those imprisoned, terrorized, or killed, we will always remember that the advancement of our people was because of you. And there were a lot of formations in the Chicano movement. The Chicano movement wasn't monolithic. There were a lot of different formations in it. Tierina and the land question in New Mexico, Cesar Chavez and, and the unionizing of the campesinos in, in California, and a and, uh, little later on, the development of Ras Unida, Jose Angel Gutierrez, and all these people. In northern Colorado, you had brown berets uh, black berets that began to say, we have been expulsed from high schools. The push-out rate was probably 60 to 68 percent. And these kids started saying, we want to be responsible for the kinds of education that we think should be taught. We need to have our history taught, our culture taught. And so there was this activism across the Southwest for Chicano studies, for Mexican-American studies. In Colorado, you had the Crusade for Justice, and they built an urban movement, a youth movement that was based on the social conditions of what was going on in the Chicano communities in Denver. Emulating a lot of our movement after the Black Panthers and the Black Liberation Movement, you know, and, and that's how we started uh, dealing with the questions of the schools and dealing with the question of uh, uh, the inequalities in all aspects of society and trying to develop a consciousness. I really understood the Black Liberation Movement, the Native American Movement, the Puerto Rican Independence Movement, and all the world, that it was a worldwide movement. It wasn't just us. Speak with purpose. For you have a mouth full of arrows. You have the spine of a volcano. You are my Cuauhtem. You are my Anacaona with a spear in hand. I rose for a tongue. This is how you defend our loved ones. You are the poet. Born out of the ashes of the Nochtitlan. So spit fire, write fire, for it has been said that the dry grass will set fire to the whole forest. So beat the drum in your throat. Put flames at my feet, and I will follow behind. <laughs>
what really sparked the Chicano movement was uh, the whole question of police crimes in our community, you know. And in Colorado, it was uh, a young man that was uh, killed by the Denver police, uh, beat him to death and at the Cowboy Inn in East Denver. And they gave him a real bad beating and killed him. And Going to autopsies for young boys and men who had been killed by police, I hated autopsies. It was always the same result because the, the, the first one that got the official autopsy was the police. And then we'd get second by the time we'd get, I mean, I'd see the, you know, they cut them up, cut the, the breastbone and pull out the guts and cut from the back of the head. And I, I just, uh, I got sick and tired of going to autopsies. And it didn't matter, the kid was dead. He got killed by a cop, there was no, <laughs> with that there was no doubt. Shortly thereafter, they killed another young man in West Denver. Uh, they attributed his death to the fact that he had an unusually thin skull. And they crushed his skull with the clubs when they beat him, so. Those are the things that inspired us and kind of woke us up to say, well, what the heck is going on? Who's going to do something about this? And it was an occurrence that was happening not only in Colorado, but in California and Texas and New Mexico and Arizona, wherever we were. That's what sparked us in Colorado, and that's where we started. And, and we started, uh, I guess, in a sense, to fight back. They say that those who die in the struggle for other people live on forever in the immortality of their lives. The song is called Broken Hopes. Many times in life it seems that happiness can really be. My brother Junior was a young man that was killed in, in a shootout with the Denver Police Department in 1973. We believe it, it was a direct response to his leadership and his activism with the Crusade for Justice at that time. The Crusade for Justice rose to national prominence in the late 1960s and 70s as a result of their work in Chicano communities confronting police brutality, opposing the war in Vietnam, and cultivating youth empowerment. The Crusade created numerous institutions, including a community school called Escuela Tlatelolco, and also developed housing for teachers and organizers. My brother Junior, he was always quiet, but don't put up with no shit kind of guy. You know what I mean? I was more like passive. He was more like serious. He was a serious man when it came to uh, his commitment to the Chicano movement. Uh, he was a dance instructor at the Escuela Tlatelolco. He uh, was also one of the original leadership of the Black Beret security group. That's what got him involved with the Crusade for Justice. He was a not an outgoing person that wanted recognition, but he was a very solid young man. He was representing the whole community that was being oppressed, and he felt that it was his obligation and his, his responsibility to defend the Chicano movement and the principles that it stood for. <laughs> One time, this is a true story. <laughs> we were at this party in the West Side, and he went outside, and he was sitting at the curb, man, and this dude came walking by a homeless dude. He said, I really like, that is a beautiful shirt. My brother, to show you what Junior was about, he took the shirt off and gave it to the dude. I told him, where's your shirt? <laughs> and he said, I gave it to this dude. I said, you did what? He said, I got a lot of shirts. But to show you, the in-depth love that he had for his people. He gave him his shirt off his back, and we went home with no shirt. <laughs> Junior was one of the youth leadership, and he, he was subjected to numerous beatings. He did get beat up many times by the I mean, severely. Severe one time, he got so beat up that oh, we called Corky and Corky called the lawyers and they said they didn't have him. Well, they did have him. He was in jail. But he, they beat him so bad that two days later, my mom went to get him out. She couldn't recognize him. 
She could not recognize him. Her own son. That's how bad they beat him. And he told me that was the last time he was going to take a beating by the police. He would never take another one. And oh, I could remember this day distinctively. We were in my mom's kitchen, and uh, he was leaving. I was leaving. I said, oh, okay, I'm talk to you later, bro. I'm going to got a brown paper bag and stuck a 38 in a bag. And, and I said, what are you doing, bro? You need to walk around with that gun like that? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, what if he had stopped on a humbug? You know they're messing with us? He said, well, you know what? If they stop me, they ain't a humbug. They'll stop me because they know who I am. And they're going to beat me again. And I want to get beat. So the end result is, is the March 17th, the attack by the police on the terrorist apartments that the crusade had where most of the teachers that taught at the school lived and some other crusade members lived in. So, you know, Junior is killed and Mario Vasquez is arrested and, and uh, along with Ernesto Vigil and Ernesto shot in the back. And uh, I don't know how Mario survived that because he was in the apartment that was blown up. When the altercation came, he had a gun, they had a gun, there was a shootout, he died, a police officer got shot at his hands. We had an autopsy performed by a different coroner that we brought from California. He said that Junior was shot two different times with two different weapons. So we feel that he was wounded in the original confrontation, but he was cornered in an area across from the Crusade for Justice. And we believe that they, they finished the job there. Junior confronted police outside of the terrace apartments over the harassment of another Chicano. A shootout ensued and Junior was chased and killed in a nearby alley. This led to a full-scale attack on the terrace apartments during which an explosion destroyed most of the building. Crusade members defended themselves. Several were shot and injured and more than 30 were arrested. Many people believe the explosion was caused by the police. Following the raid, the city demolished the apartments. No one was ever charged for the murder of Luis Jr. Martinez. Though we seen our homes broken, we must go on. The first anniversary for his death, there were over 10,000 people that came in support of him and marched in Denver, Colorado. Junior inspired all the neighborhood and gave them the inspiration to think, you know what, I'm as good as anybody. True revolutionaries are driven by love and the love of his people. And that's, that's what Junior believed in and he was willing to die for it. For our struggle to be one. For our struggle to be one. Luis Jr. Martinez. One of the reasons that the attack came on my brother Jr. and Crusade for Justice is at that time, that was the era of Wounded Knee when the Native Americans took over Wounded Knee. On February 23, 1973, activists from the American Indian Movement occupied the town of Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota to protest the corruption of the tribal government and the history of abuse of Native Americans by the U.S. government. The occupation was met with a heavy military response by the federal government, including the use of armored personal carriers, grenade launchers, and FBI agents, U.S. Marshals, and National Guard troops. The week before the March 17th attack on the Crusade, we had done a major demonstration in support of Wounded Knee in Denver. We had over 2,000 people that marched from the crusade to the state capital in support of the brothers and sisters in Wounded Knee. Our origin story, our, our land is Aslan, the, the American Southwest, and we see ourselves as the descendants of, of the ancient peoples of Mexico. We have the bloodline to this land, and we will always have that bloodline. So when the native uh, people started AIM, naturally we came together. It was a natural process and, and 
you know, we've always respected all of the, the positions that the Native people have taken. We've supported them. I participated in the 71-day uh, siege of uh, Wounded Knee in 1973. When I came to CSU, I met all these young uh, Chicano activists and became friends with them. And, and uh, I uh, recruited some of them to join AIM and they came with me to uh, Wounded Knee and picked up a gun and participated. They fought right along us in, in the bunkers. And, and so that was something that we realized the seriousness of this movement, the struggle, the uh, Chicano movement, the Indian movement, the indigenous movement. We, we, I always say we, we, we began a worldwide indigenous movement. You'll see this famous picture where this young Native American has an AK-47 and he says this was sent by the Chicano brothers and sisters uh, from the crusade and more are coming. Who was flying in the supplies from the San Luis Valley? Rocky Madrid. He got shot and wounded and he was taking the medical supplies to Wounded Knee. After the occupation had ended, we kind of became part of the underground railroad of the American Indian movement. There were American Indians that were wanted for different reasons and and it was the Chicano movement in Colorado that, that hid these guys out in many cases and moved them from point A to point B and, and I, I'm aware of some of that, let's just put it that way. It's fair to say that the attack at the Crusade for Justice's school in March of 1973 was a consequence of that unity between the Chicano movement and the American Indian movement. I want us to keep in mind that people die twice. Once as mortals and once in memory. I weep when memories are lost. Probably the biggest thing that we were able to understand at the beginning of the Chicano movement was how we were connected to Mexican history, was the understanding of what the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was. The 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was an agreement forced upon Mexicans through the brutal and bloody conquest by the U.S. It created the current border by legalizing the occupation of Northern Mexico. It granted some legal rights to land to some Mexicans remaining in the U.S., but most of these grants of land were not honored. The treaty also established cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico in fighting against Native people especially Apaches and Navajos. In the two generations that transpired after the War of 1848, there was uprisings across the Southwest, in New Mexico, in Texas, in California. Those two generations are the two generations that could still understand what it was like to live under the Mexican flag. And it was after 1915 that generations were now being born within the context of the United States, and people had been displaced from the land. We became an internal migratory labor force that was being exploited by the railroads, that was being used in the sugar beet fields, that was being used in the cotton fields, and, and agribusiness, the meat packing plants, the mining industry. The town that I was raised in, Alamosa, was a railroad town. Periodically, there were always little blow-ups down there over water, over land, and stuff like that. So we were, that was something that was always being talked about in our homes. The Chicano movement kind of identified points of self-determination, and probably one of the most enlightening of, the, of that time period was Reyes Lopez Tijerina, who was involved in the land struggles of New Mexico. And again, that takes us back to, to understanding who we were and the creation of that border, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and Tijerina comes on the scene and says, you know what, this land was ours. We're now going to reclaim the land based on all of these legal documents. And the Tijerina, the land grant thing in, in uh, Rio Rebo County, was really what I guess brought home to us because it was on national TV. And it, it really made an impact. Reyes Lopez Tijerina led the Chicano land grant movement in northern New Mexico. Using the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which promised land to Mexicans, he organized the Alianza to demand these rights be met. Following a historic raid on the courthouse of Tierra Maria, 
The Alianza faced highly militarized U.S. repression. Tijerina and others were arrested and prosecuted for their resistance. Well, to bring justice and help the people and answer the needs of the Spanish-speaking people in the Southwest, especially in New Mexico, I had to uh, establish an organization which would appeal to their needs, their interests, their aspirations, and their dreams. Since their life was uh, bind uh, and attached to the land grants, the land grant and the pueblos, uh, therefore I had to uh, establish the organization based on the land question in order to, to attract their attention and to relay their message, their needs to the federal government, which needs were bound or bind by, by a treaty, an international treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The question of land base, that's essential to this, and Tijerina is raising that. And who of the big four, Corky Gonzalez, Cesar Chavez, Jose Angel Gutierrez, who goes to prison? Tijerina, why? Because of the land. You, when you start to mess with the land, you're in the entrails of capitalism and imperialism, and, and you're messing with this, their federal structure that they've developed. And you're actually calling for a dismemberance of that when you're saying, this is our land base. Everybody you talk to today that's Mexican knows, or will tell you, this is all part, once part of Mexico. You know, that's another part of the Chicano movement that many of us got and some didn't. Because at that time, there were maybe 10 million of us. And today, there's 15 million of us. But without that border, there's 200 million of us. And there's never been a good relationship between the United States and Mexico. There have been repeated invasions and takings of property, takings of land. And so for that reason, we say to our people in the South, uh, come. You don't need papers to come here, cross. Cross a la brava. Because every time a Mexican crosses the border illegally, they're reclaiming the North. This, this part of the country, you know, the land, the land is what gives you your, your identity and your pride. And once you have an identity, once you can develop your identity and you have pride in who you are, that's a big, that's a big hurdle for oppressed nations and people who are discriminated against. Because that's what they're trying to deprive you of, is your identity and your pride. So that's when you become dangerous, when you have identity and pride. At that point in the 1960s, there was a lot of upheaval around the country. The Black Panther Party was on the move. We began to learn about other struggles internally in the United States. Today we talk about globalization, and what globalization means is neoliberal politics. But in the 1960s, globalization was really about self-determination and decolonization for third world countries, people who were in national liberation struggles. It was during an era of what was called national liberation, Former colonies of European powers or America were li being liberated or freeing themselves or freeing themselves more. It's like Cuba was more free, the Congo was more free, an African became president of the Congo in 1960, uh, Algeria became free. So these movements of independence and national liberation pushed back the imperial power and that was in the early 60s and into the early 70s. And that's where we learned about liberation about self-determination. It was through the experiences in, in 1959 with the Cuban Revolution. We knew that Che Guevara and the Cubans had opposed the United States and that they had dared to speak and that they had dared to voice and that they had dared to stand up. And so we then embraced that because that was our struggle too. And then I think that probably the biggest impact on the Chicano movement in terms of self-determination and understanding oppression came with our understanding of what was happening with the Vietnam War. Understanding Vietnam, what had happened, the colonialism, the French colonialism, then the U.S. involvement, U.S. Uh, troops and military and the amount of monies, and, and our relatives had gone to World War II and now our uncles were going to 
to, to the Vietnam War and understanding what that meant. I was in Da Nang Air Force Base. I was in the Air Force. I worked on F-4 Phantoms, worked on the flight line. And I remember the night that we got word that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. All the black airmen that were in our squadron all moved into one barracks that night. And they spray painted on the side of the barracks, black power. I just remember thinking about that, thinking about it a lot for days. Before that year was over, I decided that I didn't think we ought to be in Vietnam. I went to my commanding officer and I told him that I didn't think that I could do any more uh, to support the war. And he kind of read the riot act, said, well, you know, that in a war zone, uh, that could be treason. As a result of its impact across all sectors of society, the anti-war movement in the United States faced intense state repression. One of the most influential anti-war mobilizations for the Chicano movement was the Chicano Moratorium, held in August 1970. More than 30,000 people marched in Nice, Los Angeles to protest the war in Vietnam. The police brutally attacked the peaceful march, killing four people and arresting more than 150. And I knew about the anti-war movement in the United States and I made a commitment to myself that as soon as I got back to the States, I was going to get involved somehow with the anti-war movement. So all of those ideologies flooded into our mindset, into our vocabulary, and we began to see a reflection of ourselves in those struggles. And that was empowering. When you could see what they were doing and you could understand your own social conditions and say, yes, we can change these things. I think one of the most uh, important things of that time period is there was a, a really good relationship from students to community and community to students. You know, and we, that was really key. And, and I always felt that students were really an integral part of, of the work we were trying to do. And we needed to break open that aspect. And it was a very progressive, radical sector. When we went to, to universities and colleges, we were able to come together with other people that looked like us. We were able to acquire an understanding of what had happened to our community. And that is why the Chicano movement was a grassroots movement. It was a grassroots movement where people came together and they shared stories, they shared experiences, and we all came from those small communities. Many of us had been migratory farm workers. My parents were farm workers. I was a farm worker. So we went to universities and found people who, who shared those same experiences, who shared those same ideals. I was recruited to go to the University of Colorado at Boulder through the great society programs that were being created. Through the Migrant Action Program is how I ended up getting to the university. So once there, there was also an UMAS program that had been created in the United Mexican American Studies Organization. And so those two groups were, were kind of competing with each other. The MAP students, which is Migrant Action Program students that I was a part of, were told, don't talk to the UMAS organization because those are the radical folks. Those are the people that are going to get you in trouble. Those are the people that are doing the protesting. And probably that's the worst thing you can ever tell a young person, don't go do something, because the first thing you're going to do is go see what is happening over there that you're being left out of. So that's how I ended up participating in the, in the organization. In 1968, I went on campus and I heard this, uh, Chicano power, brown power. So I asked this other freak that was, hey man, what's What's with this? Oh, they're UMAS and MAP, right? And they're communists. You should stay away from them. And I says, well, he ain't called them. And you got scary. <laughs> Part of our task was to go and to recruit students to come to the university campus. I was from the San Luis Valley, so I was appointed to go and recruit from high schools in the San Luis Valley. We had to do fundraising for the program because there wasn't financial support at that point. So women led a lot of the fundraising events that were going on. At that point, we were also involved in the political organizing part of it. So for the first time, you were beginning to understand what it was like to be in a protest, carrying a picket sign, 
going to Safeway on Saturday mornings, protesting at the university so that they would not have grapes on campus. And so it was empowering and so many young women were involved in those, in those processes of building the organization. UMAS grew like a prairie fire. It, it, it started with eight or nine students, I understand, and maybe a professor. And the first year they had 60 students, and the next year they had like 300, and after that they had 900, and by the time it reached its peak, we had probably close to 1,400 students on the university campus. In the morning, I'd get out there, and i um, and I says, oh, God. Uh, remember I told you that I would never become a communist. I promised that. I says, but there's, there's an issue here. <laughs> These people are all talking. Spanish and they're eating Mexican food and they're dancing Chicano dances. Man. I want a part of that, man. I said, so, you know, uh, I'm going to join the Communist Party, man, because, you know, I want to eat well, live well. So I joined them. I said, my name is Juan Federico Miguel Arguello Trujillo Azteca Mestizo Chicano. And I'm fucking pissed off because they lied to me, man. All of this garbage about the fathers of my country, Lincoln. I bought that whole story, man. I had assimilated, but I didn't acculturate. And all of a sudden, they me agarró del corazón and they just drug me into it. And from that moment on, I belonged to UMAS. We graduated more lawyers one year than uh, Chicano lawyers than Colorado ever had in its entire history. So, I mean, it was, there was big obstacles just being knocked out of the way, doors being swung open. It's an honor to be here and, and read the work of Heriberto Terran, amazing poet. And uh, for us as an organization, uh, it means a lot because uh, it's our duty and it's our job to keep, you know, these traditions alive and the stories of our people alive. And so through his poetry, um, Heriberto achieves that. And this specific poem is uh, titled La Tragedia de Ricardo Falcón. And I'm pretty sure it's a corrido. Because from the way it sounds, it's a corrido. And so Ada just came up to me and he said, what if you did this as a corrido? And I was like, oh no. <laughs> but I don't know, let's give it a try. Salieron de Colorado, casi para amanecer, para una junta muy grande que tenían que hacer. Ricardo Falcón was a, he was a very well-known student leader and activist, very capable. And he was a rough guy. He wasn't somebody you played around with. You know, if you're going to mess with Ricardo, you're going to have consequences. And he could move the people in the prisons. He could move the people in the barrios. And he could move the students. Ricardo Falcón is a brother. I loved him, man. A quick story. I was in the UMC one day. Freddy Granados and I were in the UMC and, and Ricardo. And, and this guy comes in there into the UMAS office. Hey, you know that they're serving Coors beer here. And he said, no. In Boulder, back in those days, Joseph Coors was on the Board of Regents. And when I heard about that, and I said, is this is a Coors guy from Golden? When I heard him, I went to one of their Regents meetings and he was talking about these brawlers bitches and these goddamn queer hippies and these, I uh, used to refer to Umas as the Chicano Mafia. You know, he, he was just dirty, nasty, some bitch. And then there was a Chicano conference in Denver I went there, I asked all of the student groups from across the state at their campus to boycott Coors, so they did. So we went in there, we said, we want a beer, and this guy said, what kind of beer you want? So this guy started saying, we got Miller, and blah, 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 blah. Oh, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. We just got Coors. I'm gonna give you, since you are my first customers, I'm gonna give you a free Coors. And he says, uh, he said, no, you got a Coors? And he said, yeah, right here. These two taps. We just tapped it just now. You'll be the first one. And Freddie reaches over there, and he opens him spigot so the beer could just run down in, into the sink, right? And um, this guy jumps up, and he jumps. What are you doing, man? What are you doing? 
Falcon gets up from him and decks him, man. This guy laying on the ground, and Falcon stands over him and says, Are you willing to die for Coors, man? It's not worth it. Salieron con mucha prisa de color para tejón. Con la delegación venía el soldado Ricardo Falcón. Como pasa muchas veces, chale, el carro se le calentó. En oro grande pararon y Falcón se abajó. Empezaron a echar agua, pues se querían arrancar. Con rumbo al paso Texas, pues ellos querían llegar. El gringo de la estación por la agua se la cantó. Como era Falcón Chicano del gringo no se dejó. Se hicieron de palabritas y hasta chingazos llegó. Y aquel desgraciado gringo su pistola le sacó. Dos balazos en el pecho, el gringo le disparó, matando a aquel hombre noble, a que mano limpia peleó. El asesino fue gringo y a la cárcel no fue a dar, pero le jura a la gente que así no se va a quedar. Así acaba mi corrido, así acaba mi canción. Estas son las mañanitas para el carnal Falcón. Un corrido como un homenaje a la memoria de Ricardo Falcón. A brief announcement, there is a press conference going on, I understand, by Colorado. If anyone wishes to join it, it's over here toward the left somewhere. I also had a report that Colorado is wearing the black armbands in mourning for Ricardo Falcón as a symbol. Ricardo had, had graduated from CU Boulder and applied to law school in 1970. Late 1971, early 1972, he was admitted into law school. At that time, we were organizing feverishly for La Raza Unida here in Weld County, and he was a candidate for sheriff of Weld County. La Raza Unida was created in 1970 to politically represent Chicanos in the Southwest. The party's grassroots campaigns and candidates won several local elections. And the convention was coming up in, in Texas in, um, in August of 1972. The community was prepared, meetings were held, delegates were selected. So Ricardo and, and a carload of, of people leave as with all of us, we, we, you know, we organize on a dime and a prayer. You know, you, you go with what you have, and one of the friends had, a, had an older car, so they decided, well, well, that's what we have, that's what we'll take. So they took the old car, and the car was overheating, overheating various spots through their journey. They ended up in a little town called Oro Grande, New Mexico. So they pull into the gas station, the guys jump out of the car, they find the water spout. In those days they had water spouts at station still. Open the hood, they're watering the radiator. Perry Brunson, the owner of the gas station, comes out and he says, uh, well, we don't waste water around here. What are you doing? We don't waste water around here. Ricardo says, well, the car's overheating. We need to get it cooled off. And, and Perry Brunson says, well, you know, I don't appreciate you doing this. And he says, don't worry, we're gonna, we'll pay you, we'll reimburse you, we'll, we'll take care of it. And he says to the group, you Chicano motherfuckers are all alike. And he walks back into the station. And so Ricardo says to the group, I'm going to go in and see what's going on with this guy and pay him for the, pay for the water. As he walks into the gas station, he opens the door. Perry Brunson's inside, and in front of him is a counter. And he reaches into the counter and pulls out a 38 and shoots Ricardo five times. Uh, one of the gentlemen that's out in the car hears the gunshots, he runs in, and he, he then tr wrestles Perry Brunson to the ground for the gun. Ricardo has turned around and walked out of the gas station and then collapses, and he bleeds to death. I would like to say that since I've been here on Wednesday, and from what I've been able to see, I know, I know in my heart and in my soul that my husband was murdered. The town of Oro Grande and Alamogordo 
helped Mr. Brunson in every way they could with the murder because no attempt, no attempt of any sort of help was given to my husband. I would like to ask Mr. Brunson and the community of Oro Grande and the community of Alamo Gordo, I would like to ask them, how do I tell my two-year-old son that my husband was murdered? He was murdered in Alamo Gordo over water and no help was given to him. I would like to ask them that why was he murdered by this racist man, Mr. Brunson, who belongs to the American Independent Party? And how do I explain this to my son? We lost a man. Brunson walked out on his own, his own personal recognizance. No Chicano in this state or any state in the Southwest or any barrio in this country would have walked out on his personal recognizance without a no bond, or up to a hundred to five hundred thousand dollar bond and charges of first degree murder. No Chicano, no black, no member of minority group in this country would have given, been given the graces that Perry Brunson was given. And Perry Brunson reminds us once more of the racist society that we have to deal with. Ricardo Falcon was a strong man in a society that wants everyone weak and dying from the disease of social, cultural, and political exploitation. Ricardo was an individual in a melting pot that seeks to control us and manipulate us. Ricardo was el grito del barrio Bato in a society that crucifies the Bato. Nails the rebel mind to the cross of racismo America. Ricardo was just a carnal un activista, un hombre que daba tanto para la raza que ni tenía tiempo para la vida de él. Ricardo era el grito de libertad, de justicia, contra el gigante monstruo. Ricardo era el grito de la raza unida. Justicia, igualdad, community control, self-determination, all part of a movimiento within Ricardo to win the long time suffering of our Chicano brothers and sisters. Understanding, uh, number one, the, the assassination itself. Number two, understanding the American Independent Party, uh, George Wallace, what he stood for. What that did is it began to unveil the state, what apparatuses the state was able to use, what were willing to use to annihilate its own population. We grow up believing in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights and that you have all these rights and privileges. But then these experiences happen to you and an unveiling happens where you say, no, there's something wrong here. We have to explain this. What does this mean to me? And I think there's several choices that we make. One, we can just back off and not do anything. Or number two, you step up and say, no, this is wrong. You, you become a Lupe Breseño, you become a Josie Lujan, you become a, a Neva Romero, you become a Nula, Una Jacola, and you say, no, these things are wrong, and we have to challenge these things. And so you have, a, you have this evolution, this development uh, over time. Perry Brunson was acquitted of the murder of Ricardo Falcón. Ricardo Falcón! <laughs> As we got more involved as students, we had no avenues um, to push our issues forward. That's why we always had to hit the streets. That's, that was our best recourse, was to hit those streets and let the people see us. And so eventually we had our own martyrs within the, within the movement, people who really put their lives on the line to take issue with um, all of this repression. The attack on, on the student movement was really key for the state because uh, uh, there's no revolutionary movements in the world without an intelligentsia. And this was the intelligentsia. We had people in, in employment, in positions, you know, uh, who were very vocal and were leaders and um, uh, activists. And they stood with the students, and, and, and uh, unfortunately, 
um, Ricardo Falcón was fired, he was let go. And uh, eventually Fre Freddy Granado and various other people, uh, a number of students were banned from campus. They started messing with us. They were alarmed by how we were changing the culture of the university and they started losing our financial aid applications, our files, the most vocal, the most, uh, the strongest advocates, the, the militants, the ones that were doing the, leading the demonstrations and all that, they were being targeted. It was their financial aid files that were being lost. And that summer there was a purge of, I would estimate at least 90 students that were blacklisted from the university and told that they couldn't come back. I think they got restraining orders against most of them. Throughout the early 1970s, the climate on UC Boulder's campus remained tense. On October 29, 1973, a handful of students took over an office in Regent Hall. After a brief standoff, students marched on Mackey Auditorium to confront Vice President James Corbridge and State Representative Sandy Arnold. A meeting with the governor was promised, but the governor left after only five minutes and the UMA students were forced out by state police. The occupation of TB1 followed. Voy a cantar un corrido que en Colorado pasó. Murieron los seis de Boulder dos noches en mayo en 74. Things just got more heated. Long story short, some students decided that they needed to take over the Equal Opportunity Office. It was a little building in the back of the campus, nothing significant. In fact, it was slated to be knocked down, and, and, and they called it TB1, a Temporary Building Number 1. I was one of the original eight people that took over TB1. On the morning of May 13, 1974, eight students occupied TB1. The students demanded the firing of UMAS EOP director Joe Franco and assistant director Paula Costa for approving attacks on students. The TB1 occupation became an epicenter for student organizing over the next three weeks. We thought we'd be in there just a couple, two or three hours because we had taken buildings before on campus and, and they had, uh, uh, after a couple, two or three hours of negotiation, they would let us leave the building, right? Well, uh, we ended up uh, staying there. We ended up staying in this building. A day passed, two days, three days, four days. We were not getting any communication, and it was very clear that they weren't going to work with us. And uh, we were nearing the end of the semester and graduation, now going into a second week. Campus basically fell quiet. Most of the students were gone for the summer. The very first day, we, we burned a coffin out here because we said that Umas was dead, that the university had killed Umas, and we buried it. We burned it, and we buried it, and we put up a cross. In the final days of the occupation, police surveillance and harassment increased. On the evening of May 27th, an explosion rocked Boulder's Chautauqua Park. The 27th of May, Neva Romero was killed. Reyes, Martinez, and Una Jacola. So that night we were outside, it was a beautiful night, but we heard a blast, a tremendous blast, and it was crack, boom, unbelievable, but it was only two, three seconds long, and we didn't know what to do, where it, where it was, what was going on. We sent some people up here to look around. They had found Neva's ID card up here near the car. Everybody knew Neva on campus. She was a, on the student council, 21 years old. It was in the middle of the night when my husband woke me up and said, you know, um, I, I had my little girl next to me. She was just a year old. And uh, he said, you better go home. There's been an explosion at Chautauqua Park and they found Neva's ID. And I went downstairs and everyone was just in shock. You know, we couldn't believe that it would happen. And secondly, uh, she was uh, one of our, of our leaders, and so that hurt. Reyes was 25 years old when he died. He left behind 
a grieving family. He left behind people who cared about him, people that he had been struggling with. He left behind a brother that loved him dearly, a brother that had shared with him the experience of law school and of young lawyers active in the movement. I read about it in the New York Times, because I was gone. At first, the authorities were speculating that I was one of the dead. And my mother's quoted in the media as saying that I've buried once and I'm preparing, I'm making preparations to bury another one. I remember being in law school and missing Reyes's company so much, missing Francisco's company. And it wasn't Francisco that I would write to because he was alive and I still had the hope that somewhere, someday we would see him again. But to Reyes, it was easy to write letters and tell him how much I missed him, that he had dropped the fusil, his armament had fallen with his death, and that I would pick it up. The night of the first bombing, about 60 students gathered at TB1 in shock and disbelief. Heriberto Teran, an aspiring poet, read a piece titled Aztlán está de luto in honor of Reyes, Una, and Neva. Suenan de nuevo los tambores de entierro. Aztlán está de luto. Los gritos de color vuelan con el aire. Tres madres lloran por sus hijos. Porque Aslan está de luto de nuevo. Florencio Granado gave a passionate speech in which he declared that Chicano blood had been spilled. He paraphrased Che Guevara and said, If I advance, follow me. If I hesitate, push me. If I betray you, kill me. If I am assassinated, avenge me. Freddy came up and he said, you know, we got to do something about what's happening here, you know? Gave us that pep talk, you know, hang in here and all of that stuff. And, and we were doing the best that we could because we were dying of a broken heart. 48 hours later, Esteban Ortega came in and said, did you hear that? I said, no, what are you talking about? It sounded like an explosion. Granados had been killed. Francisco Doherty, Roberto Teran, and Antonio Alcantara had been really hurt, really bad, but he was alive. We then really freaked out because, you know, it's 48 hours between two bombings, you know? We here at Laredo Junior College were very much impressed by Francisco's ability to endear himself to his professors, staff, as well as students. We feel we have lost a future potential physician, as well as a warm, close friend. We hugged each other and cried and screamed and hollered and did everything that we had to do to let go of that, that anger and that pain. After the second bombing, I don't know if it was like the very first day, but or later in the day, but the phone rang. And it was somebody from the university and they, they said that they wanted to meet and negotiate an end to our occupation. And myself and a, a law student by the name of Manuel Lopez went and met with the number two guy in the administration here. We sat down and we negotiated a, an end to the occupation. And uh, we finally left. We finally left the building at that point, we had, we'd been in that building for about three weeks. The students and the CU Boulder administration agreed that Franco and Acosta would be removed from their positions, UMAS EOP would be restructured to include elected student leadership, and those involved in the occupation would be granted amnesty from criminal prosecution. The six murdered activists became known as Los Seis de Boulder. No one was ever charged for the deaths of those Seis. Four days after the second bombing, we had a commemoration there. We had a, a, a large meeting of people who came in from all over the state. We were afraid, but we didn't panic. The purpose of this letter is not to vent our emotions. We are writing to you all to plead for human love and understanding. 
As long as we have prejudice toward our fellows, we will have resultant confrontations. We pray that those of you who read this note will take the time and effort to search inside yourselves as we have and come to the same conclusion, that for us to survive as a nation, as a social order, we must begin to change ourselves now. Yeah, it was a, a very, a very horrible, terrible time. And when I think about it, it, it bothers me because I knew all of these people. I worked with them. You know, so we ate together, we crashed together, we traveled all over the country together. You know, on the picket lines. You know, wherever, all the way to to Cesar Chavez to. The Leno out there, you know, doing all this stuff for the movement, right? And I was like, hijo, like cutting off our, one of our arms. We all vowed that we would never let them down and we would not let people forget. Reyes Martinez. Reyes! Neva Arlene Romero. Presente! Una Chacona. Presente! Francisco Doherty. Presente. Florencio Freddy Granado. Presente. Heriberto Terán. Presente. The martyrs of the Chicano movement unleashed the pretensions of the U.S. state. The martyrs of the Chicano movement, what they basically did is what Paulo Freire said. You have to take the mask off. You have to take that bubble wrap off and see what the reality is. And that's what they did for us. There are many underrecognized martyrs of the Chicano movement. One of them was Carlos Zapata, a Vietnam veteran and a young activist born and raised in Denver. Carlos died in 1978 in an explosion that occurred outside of the Veterans of Foreign Wars office. He began working as a community organizer with the Crusade for Justice. He taught martial arts and self-defense and was an ardent follower of Malcolm X and his politics. So that was him. He was smart, intelligent. He loved the movement. You gotta remember them, you know, and who they were and what they stood for. Carlos stood for his movement. All I know is he got Blowed up, you know. He was one of the fallen because of the movement, of what he believed in. He believed in his blood, you know. Carlos Zapata. How can we believe that the United States government can go into Chile and overthrow the government, but they can't kill people here? If they are going to do it there, brothers and sisters, they're going to do it here. And that's what the Chicano movement was all about. It was the demasking of the state to say, you struggle, you take the consequences. There are yet people who need revolution. Because they're never going to get a job, and they're never going to get a fair shake, and they're never going to get dem democratic rights in this system. They need a revolution. We need a revolution. So a new movement is coming. I can feel it. I see it in our youth because we still haven't reached that pinnacle where we should be at. And it's going to come again. And all of us older people, we have a responsibility to support the younger people. And they're going to create a movement based on their social conditions, their social reality, and they're going to develop their own leadership. A lot has happened in this country to make us believe that we can succeed here, that if we just lift ourselves up by the bootstraps, that we can succeed. And more and more people are recognizing that that reality isn't necessarily true. And I think that kind of awakening is an important parallel to the Chicano movement. This then becomes a critical moment for us in terms of organizing. The sad part about it is, you know, I think about my grandkids, for example, and I think they have a greater possibility of living in poverty. They have more difficulty now attending college than my generation had. There's a lot of struggle left, or there's a lot left to struggle for. Our people do come together, and when we come together, we're strong, and the possibilities are endless, and 
it's time to reignite that. Our issues have certainly changed. Our police force is being militarized. The immigration issue is even bigger than it was when we were in school. Thinking about our brothers and sisters who we don't have the proper documentation that we need to be in this occupied land, it puts a real sense of fear. And until we decolonize our minds around this is our home, this is where we belong, we'll continue to live with that fear. We have demonstrations every month at the Mexican consulate here in Denver to bring attention to the repression that's happening south of the imposed border. We still have a long way to go, but we learn from the past and it re-energizes us and it reignites us. I think that the Chicano movement opened up a vision that with collective organizing, you can make social change. And I think that was why the Chicano movement was so powerful because you had a collective of people who understood who they, who they were, who were able to explain what colonialism meant. And not only that, but said, I wanna take the next step. I wanna make the social change. And looking at global struggles to see what the models are that are out there. What is the possibility with the situation that I have at hand? And I think that is where we are today. I see young people looking around the world and saying, what is happening with the Zapatistas? What is happening with Ayotzinapa? What is happening in my community? And how can I work together with you to make that social change? I just really feel like if I know my history, I know myself better. If I don't, I'm kind of like incomplete, you know? We have to learn how to tell your story. And we tell our stories to make sense of our lives. 40 years ago, not only were students fighting for us to be on this campus, but they died for us. They died so that we could be here. And sometimes I just go and stand right in front of TV One. And you know what I remember? That people here fought for us. And we can't just let ourselves be scared and leave, but we have to resist and use the same strength that they use to stay on campus, to educate ourselves, and to go back to the communities and help them. There is no loneliness like the loneliness of a community organizer in the barrios. There is no loneliness like the loneliness of a Chicano activist who fights for la raza in the middle of a racist pit of fire. Many of us have known or known that loneliness. That what would Los Ace de Boulder and these other young people that died, what would their lives have been like? What contributions could they have made had they lived? And it just, 40 years later, it still continues to be so unfair, so unreasonable that we lost them even before the prime of their life. We lost them just as they had been incubated and were coming out, just as their metamorphosis had been completed and they were the shining butterflies of our life. When we die, let us die as Ricardo did. Let us die fighting in the barrios, in the jails, in the college campuses, in the fields, in the streets, for our raza. Let us all be organizers in every day of our lives. And for Ricardo, because I know this is what he would want, the grito that he always shouted on the streets, on the fields and the universities and the school. Chicano! 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 Viva la raza! Viva la casa! Que siempre viva Ricardo Falcón! Gracias. Forty years later, we have come a long ways. We have to keep dreaming and pass our dream along. And, and not only the dream, but pass along the story of the struggle, pass along the story of the people that we lost, pass along the tears, 
because all of that makes a life complete. And pass along hope, pass along hope that things will be better.